Hello again, everyone. Um, I'm going to briefly present some work that actually quite a large group of us have been doing for the past few months on agent-based modeling of the UK's land system um, and using this in order to explore alternative future scenarios in the UK. Um, and I'm particularly going to talk about why we found this useful um, to explore sort of neglected areas of future scenario space. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the SSPs, socioeconomic scenarios, describing global and often local regional um, socioeconomic conditions into the future. And these are often very detailed and they describe very different worlds in the future. But we tend to analyze them with relatively simplistic and convergent models. And I mean by that just that the models often don't include many of the socioeconomic factors that actually define the scenarios and make them different from one another. For example, we were, well, we have been using uh, this, this new group of UK focused SSPs, which you can see in the diagram here. And the brief narratives will be familiar for many of you who know the global SSPs. But these include a lot of factors, a lot of processes that are not easily modelable or not often contained in models. For example, SSP1 has new forms of sustainable agriculture and preferences for non-economic ecosystem services. Uh, SSP2 has a, a big growth in green technology in agriculture. SSP3 represents complete breakdown of uh, social and governance systems and the, the political breakup of the UK. SSP4 has, is a highly unequal society with a massive consolidation of land holdings. And SSP5 is very um, production focused, a highly intensive future world. And we have tried to capture some of these divergent conditions in a, in a flexible agent-based modeling framework, partly as an experiment to see how well it can represent these different scenarios, and partly to explore what these futures might look like. And to do this, we've used the crafty agent-based modeling framework, which is represented by the simple diagram on this slide. And the core of this model are the agents, which are represented by the little people symbols. And they have a range of attributes um, that describe their roles in the land system, their behaviors. Uh, they can compete, they can cooperate with each other. But fundamentally, what they're there to do is to produce ecosystem services from the land, from this gridded landscape that they're standing on. And they do this by using location attributes, which are shown on the right hand side. These um, are represented by capitals, natural, human, social manufactured and financial capitals that describe the resource availability, so how productive the landscape is. And the agents use these capitals to produce or to provide ecosystem services. <clears throat> and the total supply of these services is then compared with an external societal demand for ecosystem services. And if there's a mismatch between the two, then this drives agent behavior to adapt, to change land use, to try and meet, um, meet those demands. And what we've done here is embed this sort of core model in a framework driving it um, that's specified to the UK land system. So at the bottom there, we have baseline land cover data sets going in to give us an initial land use map from which to run. And then going to the top of the diagram, we have the scenarios. <clears throat> so we have the, these UK SSPs that I mentioned, um, and we combine those with climate scenarios. UK focused representative concentration pathways, RCPs. And these, first of all, um, slightly to the left at the top there, they, they are passed through the LANSIM global model, which gives us global food production and trade. And from that, we derive UK food demands within country food demands. And we also take direct from the scenarios um, other ecosystem service demand levels and valuations. Moving further to the left from the SSPs, we take changes to agent attributes. And then moving to the right, um, again, from the scenarios, we take changes to these location attributes, to the capitals and to the constraints related to protected areas and to urbanization. And so this um, effectively static model core is then being driven by annual changes in all of these inputs that come from the scenarios. And um, for this talk, I wanted to highlight the, the interpretation or the implementation of the scenarios in the model. 
And that's shown in this diagram, which contains a lot of probably too many symbols. But um, the, the key thing really is the, the area or the sectors within the diagram. For example, we have this behavioral sector here. Um, and that's uh, showing the, the factors that we can vary that determine individual and socially mediated behaviors affecting land management in the model. Um, on this, in this sector, we have the capitals that determine resource constraints, resource availability in the landscape. And these two sectors at the bottom of the diagram um, show the range of ecosystem services um, that are demanded and the valuations for those different ecosystem services. And then on the left there, we have the production levels, the production inputs um, for agents producing different ecosystem services, potentially giving the options for new forms and intensities of land uses in different land use sectors. And finally, at the top, we can allow policy interventions, for example, in the form of protected areas to, um, to limit land use options. And uh, showing, looking at these, um, these diagrams across all five scenarios, again, without going into any of the details, but just from the locations and the colors of the different symbols, you can see that the scenarios are very different. There's, um, in every sector of these circles, there are differences in, those, um, in the factors that are being considered and in the direction that they have relative to the baseline condition. And so the, this is not a complete coverage of the scenario narratives by any, um, by any means, but it does capture a range of different scenario conditions and convert them into, into model parameters. And jumping straight to results, I'm going to just show a few um, example results and actually all using these output maps from the model for the year 2080. And just um, as a first visual impression, you can see they're very different as we would expect. The different scenarios produce very different outcomes. And one of the ways in which they're most different is in terms of intensity, if you can see my little red circle again on the legend. Um, and actually in the model, the um, pastoral and arable land use agents have a continuous range of intensities that they can use, going from the very dark colors, very intensive land uses, to the very light colors, which are very extensive. And for example, in SSB3, towards the right-hand side, <clears throat> you see the entire map is very light. And that's because in this scenario, there are the capitals are very low. There are no inputs for agriculture. There's a lack of knowledge, a lack of um, resources that can be used. And so intensive land uses are simply not possible in that scenario. In contrast, SSB5 on the far right hand side is very dark. It's very intensive indeed. That's the highly production focused scenario. And in a way, these different examples. Um, span this range between a land sharing and land sparing type of land system, not entirely intentionally in the scenario narrative. But um, SSP1, for example, is, a, is um, a good case for, for land sharing because we have strong demands here for various ecosystem services and for sustainable production. And what we end up with in the model is um, very large areas, extensive areas, of multifunctional land uses producing a wide range of ecosystem services. SSP5, on the other hand, is a good example of land sparing because we have this very intensive production focused form of agriculture. But that means that there are areas of the UK that can be left almost accidentally to um, more natural land cover. And there are also um, convergent results that arise for different reasons. So in, in this example, um, you can see that there are quite a large number of these pinky purple um, cells on the map, which represent sustainable arable production. And in SSP1, those are occurring because they're demanded, they're, they're favored by society. Um, so there's a, a motivation for the agents to, to manage the land in that way. In SSP3 on the right-hand side, there, um, these agents are, are dominating in certain parts of the UK, not because they're wanted, but because they actually outcompete the other agent types, because they don't require the same level of agricultural inputs that more traditional intensive managers do. 
And we see a similar convergence in uh, conservation areas in, in other scenarios in the black cells on these maps. In SSP5, as I've mentioned, it's um, very strong intensification of land uses, which leads to marginal areas being abandoned. And these can then become conservation areas, even though there's no societal demand for conservation in that scenario. In SSP4 on the left, in contrast, we see similar areas of conservation, um, but those are actually an emergent property that's consistent with the storyline, because what we have in that scenario are um, large consolidation of large land. So farms become very large, very efficient. And this actually frees up, again, more marginal areas to be used for recreation and rewilding, um, which in the storyline are motivations of the rich elites in that world. And one final point I wanted to make was that um, looking at one SSP that we ran in two different climate scenarios, an RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5, you can see that the map is not noticeably different. Um, it's almost identical, in fact. And that's not because the climate scenarios are themselves almost identical. They're actually giving very different inputs to the model. But the, the range and the strength of socioeconomic differences are really dominating over the climate signal in the land use outcomes. So, um, two tentative conclusions really that we have very different outcomes in different SSPs as we might expect. And these do are largely determined by relatively underexplored aspects of the scenarios. Things like societal preferences for different ecosystem services, the options and the knowledge available to land managers partly through social networks. Um, the possibility to have varied forms and intensities of land management that differ between the scenarios and the extent to which different land sectors compete with one another. Now we found that this um, agent-based modeling approach can reveal some of these, but there are areas of scenario space that are still not explored by this approach. And this does kind of suggest that we need a diverse set of models to analyze the very diverse set of futures envisioned in the SSPs. And um, that's something that we can come back to tomorrow in the discussion sec session for those who are interested. And I'll leave it there for today.